This is a video introduction to analytical separations, which is found in chapter 22 of your analytical chemistry textbook. When we talk about analytical separations, we can either talk about solvent extractions or we can talk about chromatography. So we'll start with solvents. Uh, the idea for solvent extractions is to take advantage of the difference in solubility of your solute in different solvents. And you can do things like change the pH, you can use metal chelators, you can use simultaneous equilibria. Uh, to change this difference in solubility and improve your efficiency. In chromatography, uh, this is more of an active technique. You're passing, it, you're passing your analyte through a stationary phase using a mobile phase, and you're going to get separation by the difference in partitioning, whether your analyte uh, is more, has better affinity for the mobile phase or the stationary phase. In this case, you can use temperature, uh, mobile phase polarity, uh, stationary phase polarity, all these things to improve your separation. We'll start with solvent extractions. The idea here is that you have two immiscible phases. If your phase one and phase two are miscible, this obviously doesn't work very well. Uh, the idea is that your analyte has a different solubility in phase one than it does in phase two. And numerically this is represented by this thing called the partition coefficient, which is another, yet another K. And this is the ratio of the activities of the analyte in your two phases. And we normally just approximate this as the concentrations. Uh, these concentrations are a direct, they follow directly from the difference in solubility of your analyte between phase one and phase two. The process that you use to do this kind of separation is, let's say you have your analyte that is dissolved in some volume, call it V1, of water and we'll call water's volume V1 because we'll call water phase 1. You add a second volume of some other solvent, something that's not miscible with water and that has either a very high or very low solubility of your analyte. You want to shake this up so that your analyte has the chance to partition into the other phase or your impurities have a chance to partition and then you can collect um, one or both of the fractions and repeat the process. At the end, you can collect the water, and you will have, depending on what you want to do, you will have either removed your analyte from the water into the other phase, or your analyte will be left in the other phase in the water, uh, and all of your impurities will go into the other phase. All right, uh, we have a parameter that we use called Q, which is the amount of your analyte left over in the water. And so, in this case, you're trying to extract your analyte out of the water. Uh, so phase 1 has a concentration S1, phase 2 has a concentration S2, and Q is the mole fraction of your analyte in each phase. If you combine these equations into the partition coefficient equation, you get an expression for the efficiency of your separation, where Q to the N is the amount of analyte left in phase 1 after N separations. And in this case, you raise this equation for Q uh, to the power of n, however many identical separations you do. Uh, remember, V1 is the volume of your phase 1, in this case the water, and V2 is the volume of the other phase that you're extracting with. In theory, you can get Q to the n to be arbitrarily low just by doing a very large number of extractions. In practice, there's a practical limit given by the equation there, and if you plot both of these equations, you get two lines, uh, the blue line on the bottom, is what happens if you do a large number of extractions without taking a practical limitation into account. The actual limitation gives you the orange line. Now, sometimes you don't want 75% remaining in phase one, you want that to be lower. And so you can lower Q limit by either increasing K by changing solvents or by changing the pH or something like that. You can increase V2 or you can decrease V1 relative to V2. In either case, these will uh, make the negative exponent larger, making Q limit smaller. Another way to improve extraction efficiency is by using multiple equilibria. Uh, in some cases, this is changing the pH to incorporate a weak acid equilibrium. Uh, other cases, you have to do other things. But for the case when this is a, for example, weak base that we have uh, as our analyte, we can change the pH of, for example, phase one and protonate the weak base and that will change the concentration of B1 in phase 1, and it will also change the concentration of B in phase 2. We call the um, partition coefficient something a little different in this case. We call it the distribution coefficient, 
And you can sort of think of this in terms of the formal concentrations that we talked about earlier in the semester. Now we're not only worried about the concentration of analyte in each phase, B1 and B2. We're worried about the concentration of the analyte in all its forms. So in phase one, this would be B1. It would also be the protonated form. We call this thing, instead of the partition coefficient, the distribution coefficient. And this is the uh, mathematical expression of that. An example where this happens is a weak base like an amine. Uh, the neutral form is soluble in organics and in water. The protonated forms are only water soluble. So in this case, phase one being water, the protonated form would not partition into phase two, uh, whereas the neutral form goes back and forth. Now, chromatography does use the same principles as solvent extraction. What you're worried about is the affinity of your analyte for two different phases. In this case, we call them the mobile phase and the stationary phase. All chromatic methods have these two phases. The stationary phase is the one that's immobile, and the mobile phase moves across the stationary phase. You've done this in organic chemistry when you did thin layer chromatography. The separation occurs because of differences in partitioning between these phases, and so now we don't talk about uh, K as the different concentrations in the two phases, we talk about affinities for the phase. Um, separation is caused by a few methods. So one of these is separative transport. K can change as a result in differences of actual rates of transport. So sometimes an analyte is too big to get through small pores in a column, for example. We also have dispersive transport, which is not active separation. This is just other things in the system that broaden the solute band without actually uh, separating in a meaningful way. What we want to do when we design a chromatographic method is increase separative transport and decrease dispersive transport if we can. Some quick terms for chromatography. Uh, the mobile phase is also called the eluent because it causes the solute to elute from the column or to come off of the column. The eluate is the solute or, or mobile phase without solute dissolved in it that comes out of the end of the column. And the extent to which the solute is retained on the column is called the retention. Retention time is the time that it takes after the injection for the component to elute. And this is not always very straightforward because the column has some length. And so even if something was totally unretained, it would still take a little bit of time to come off of the column. The retention time, we want just the time uh, that is longer than a totally unretained peak. And so subtracting the two gives you the adjusted retention time, TR prime. And the way you can find this out, for example, in the chromatogram shown here, uh, TM is the migration time for something that's totally unretained. In this case, it was butane. And then the retention time for one and two are uh, butanol and propanol, the time that it takes. And so the adjusted retention time for butanol and propanol is their retention time, TR1 and TR2, minus TM. The relative retention between those two peaks gets the symbol alpha, and it's found by taking the ratio of their adjusted retention times. This is also the ratio of their partition coefficient. When we characterize peaks, one of the main things that we talk about is the idea of resolution. We'll talk much more about this in class, but in general, we compare two peaks uh, and their peak widths and peak heights that are uh, determined by modeling the peaks as Gaussians, so nice, smooth bell curves. And we want them to be separated to such an extent that we can accurately figure out the area under each one. Sometimes, though, the peaks aren't pretty. And there are broadening factors and other factors that can cause the peaks to not be Gaussians, but uh, to have either tailing or uh, overloading or just spread out quite a bit. Uh, tailing and overloading in specific are caused by having either too much solute in the stationary phase, so overloading the column, or too much in the mobile phase, so it's not really interacting with the column. In either case, these things are to be avoided, uh, and you can avoid this by using the correct injection volume and by using the correct mobile phase and stationary phase for your analyte.